I feel elated to introduce the speaker of the upcoming session, Dr. Shekhar Seshagiri, the President of Science and Education, Sai Genome Research Foundation. Seshagiri holds a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and a Master of Science in Biotechnology from Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, Coimbatore, India. He is also a recipient of a Master of Science in Software Engineering from Golden Gate University, San Francisco, US and a PhD in Genetics from the University of Georgia, Athens, US. He did his postdoctoral work in Oncology and Bioinformatics at Genentech. Dr. Seishagiri is co-founder and chief scientific officer for ModMap Therapeutics. Before that, he spent 21 years at Genentech, most recently as associate director and staff scientist. During his tenure, he established a state-of-the-art genomic laboratory conducted research in cancer and cell signaling areas and participated in drug development. Dr. Seishagiri leads SGRF's scientific research activities and is the driving force behind the foundation's educational outreach activities, including conferences. He chairs SGRF's Next Gen Genomics, Biology, Bioinformatics and Technologies, that is NGBT International Meeting. His research work has been at the forefront of understanding underlying genetic changes in cancer genomes through systematic identification of somatic mutations in large number of cancer types and subtypes using next generation sequencing and other novel techniques. Seishagiri and team have applied computational methods and functional assays to understand the role of cancer-specific mutations in oncogenic signaling leading to new target discovery of therapeutic intervention. He has authored and co-authored over 80 articles in peer-reviewed journals including Science and Nature. We are grateful to have you in our midst for this faculty development program session. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, sir, introduction video is over. Uh, okay, Shaka, sir, I think you. you can start. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Hopefully you can hear me. So I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Rama in particular for uh, reaching out to me and for this. Uh, opportunity to share some of the work. Um, I'm going to try and um, provide some context to the stuff that uh, I'm going to share, but also try and uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, some of the science around it uh, comes out as well. So I, uh, uh, this particular research work um, started not too long ago, focused on the COVID-2 virus. Uh, I have a number of uh, collaborators uh, from throughout the world, and that was the theme uh, which uh, Dr. Tyagarajan started out with. In particular, I think there are many people that I am fortunate to uh, collaborate and work with uh, over the years in India. The foundation itself, uh, MedGenome, that uh, was fundamental to getting some of the data underneath or collating through their uh, tremendous bioinformatics uh, capabilities. And colleagues at uh, the uh, R&D labs at Sci Genome, and also the University of Singapore, the University of San Francisco here, uh, where I'm currently uh, at, and uh, also our uh, small therapeutic company that uh, is trying to uh, make some inroads into uh, treatment and cancer and other areas. Uh, one quick uh, slide on the foundation, and then I'll get into the science that I want to talk about. Um, it's a, a nonprofit foundation, primarily set up with the idea of promoting science education. There are many nonprofits that do a lot of things, uh, but I think uh, and uh, this has done an important uh, work in the context of outreach and education, particularly um, scientific uh, education and research. And uh, also, uh, it's done some work 
in creating healthy communities through applying science and society and primarily uh, operates on grants and uh, some of the uh, corporate uh, uh, social responsibility support. So is is it visible now? Are you able uh, to you see are it? Visible, sir. Okay. Is the slide visible uh, now? Visible, okay. Go ahead, sir. Sorry, uh, if you if you missed uh, most of it, I'll 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 try and be very quick. Uh, and I'm going to try and uh, talk about uh, the interaction between the uh, SARS receptor, SARS proteins, surface and the uh, human receptor. And this genome in Bangalore and uh, the R&D center in Cochin Sci Genome. And um, uh, we uh, also, uh, you know, have a small therapeutic company here in the United States and uh, colleagues from U University of California, San Francisco, the National University of Singapore. And clearly, Science is collaborative. I couldn't do my science without collaboration. I couldn't do the science without contributions of many people uh, well ahead of me um, in this world. Um, and and uh, so I'm very grateful for all of that. But I want to kind of uh, tell you the story in the context of this evolving disease and, and what uh, is being done. The foundation does a lot of work in outreach areas, and uh, and I'll uh, I won't belabor that uh, as you know continues to. Conferences and many of you have been there, uh, at least some of you that I know. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll start with the themes here, uh, which is. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sir, again, PPT is missing, sir. Ah, uh, okay, I don't know. Let me see. So, if I touch the video, it, it drops up. Are you able to see it now? Uh, yes, sir, now we are able to see it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it in the board and hopefully everybody can see it. Okay. Sure. So, um, you know, the history of modern humans is only about uh, 200,000 to 150,000 years, just a, a, a permanent tree. Uh, and in that time, we all mean, um, um, you know, at least in this 200,000 year history, uh, what uh, I think most of us can fathom uh, at best uh, with our own mortality ahead is, uh, you, you know, maybe 100, 150 years, but I look back in history, maybe a couple of thousand years, not 200, uh, 150,000 years. Um, but pandemics are not new. This is a this is a, a diagram taken out of a, a beautiful cartoon uh, uh, that was put by uh, um, uh, a particular group uh, called the uh, Visual Capitalist. Shaker, and what it's showing is, PPT? yeah, you're not able to see the PPT. Ah, okay. I, uh, you know, maybe I'll try and not share my video. Hold on. Okay. Benil, yeah. can you also mute yourself? Turn this off. Okay. So, uh, is are you able to see it, Ramana? No. Okay. I don't know. It just drops, I guess. How about now? Got it now. Okay. So I turned off the video. So let's see. Hopefully it works. If not, let me. So uh, slide is about uh, um, pandemics and the history of pandemics uh, developed by a group called Visual Capital, and the larger the little fuzzy ball. Um, uh, it's, it's can, more deadly. Put a red light there. No, it doesn't. Uh, I don't know. No, sometimes And the rest of the people on Skype, mute yourself, please. Yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, what you begin to see here is uh, there is a, a, a history of pandemic going back all the way to uh, you know six, uh, 165 AD. Uh, but majority have been um, probably bacterial. Some of it we don't even know what the cause is. And uh, if you look at why we talk about these pandemics, uh, you know, as I said, a hundred year history is is as big as our memories can kind of hold. Rest becomes somewhat history. Uh, but uh, the 
uh, the major bubonic plague uh, in um, you know 1300s and the smallpox and subsequently that we talk about the Spanish flu which was more recent in 1918 and the others uh, you know have been around uh, but, but in the context of the size of the impact of the population and how they, the virus and the humans have interacted and co-evolved and created a, a sort of situations where a lot of people are eliminated. And um, the Spanish flu is, is one that we know a lot about and then uh, because science was much more ahead at that time. It, it uh, infected over 500 million people and the world population was about only 1.8 billion at that time. Still about one third of the world was infected and it took about uh, almost two years for it to completely die down. I'll put this in context later on. And it resulted in uh, close to between 40 and 50 million deaths and over uh, you know, 12 to uh, 20 million people died in India alone. That was British India at that time. The docks of Mumbai were uh, the biggest source of uh, the infection coming to the country. And all of this is due with the human aspiration to travel, to trade, and, and move around. And the viruses and the bacteria also come along. And that's why you have quarantines, you have all these shocks, right? And uh, we talk of social distancing, and that's nothing new. Uh, this was done during pneumonia. If you look at the uh, bubonic plague, cities and uh, castles would, uh, would barricade and, and people will let, let it, uh, uh, the, the disease die along with the people and not uh, find new hosts. Uh, and that's the best tool we have at the moment. And that's what, uh, you know, what is happening around the world. And it's remarkable, um, a place like India with 1.3 billion people, that uh, it, it's, it's an uh, unbelievable sort of thing to be able to keep people um, indoors and prevent spread. And, and uh, India has been fairly successful. Um, but I put this in the context of history and history of science in particular. The first vaccine, uh, 1796, uh, you know, uh, uh, Edward Jenner and Louis Pasteur coming in, kind of uh, uh, evolving it. But uh, they didn't know anything about DNA. We didn't solve the structure of DNA and didn't even understand the principle of inheritance and transmission until 1953. Uh, of course, penicillin came and plagues were a thing of the past because antibiotics killed bacteria. But viruses are uh, not susceptible to any of the antibiotics. And, and of course, newer drugs came much later. But the pace of science in the last 70 years has been remarkable. And I'll put this in the context of this uh, beautiful little virus, but it's deadly. Uh, I, you know, it's basically, uh, uh, Peter Medwar uh, put it as saying, it's bad news, a protein, uh, a bad news wrapped in a protein shell. And, and inside the shell, yeah, is the uh, RNA that's unsegmented, but uh, it's uh, 30 kilobases long, makes about 29 proteins. And this information is old. Uh, you know, you already now have uh, more than 3.5 uh, million cases, 270,000 deaths across the world, and every country uh, in the world has been affected. Um, the history of uh, coronaviruses in particular uh, is not completely new, but uh, you go back in time and, uh, and look at historical facts and, and uh, there was no DNA test, there was no RNA test, but you do have material to go back in terms of written records. And also you can do molecular clock analysis using the sequence information. And what we, what we understand from all of that, and this timeline chart here, uh, we are right here, 2020. Um, uh, the MERS in 2012, the most recent, uh, these are three major coronaviruses. There is at least uh, four, four other coronaviruses that infect humans, and they're relatively mild. Uh, but uh, using molecular clock analysis, you can go back and, and figure out these viruses have been around and co-evolving with humans. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a yin-yang and who succeeds and, and who kind of uh, takes a backseat type of situation. Um, so the, the history is 800 years, but you again put this in the context of human history, it's, uh, it's relatively very small. Um, yet, uh, we are profoundly affected by this little invisible sort of organism. Uh, and, uh, and there is a clear understanding and the pace that science has moved. We know that these come from bats, uh, which carry a lot of coronaviruses. The bat seems to be fine, but these viruses jump, and uh, some of it is to do with uh, human contact with the uh, animals in between and also you know we have gone from uh, a barely 1.3 uh, uh, billion in 1918 to about 7.8 billion today and and uh, and urban centers um, and uh, high-rise buildings and uh, all sorts of things uh, contribute to this stuff and the reason the COVID-2 is particularly even more uh, prevalent and, and is able to spread one we know from the initial data it's only been four or five months of uh, study across the world 
The transmission ratio is one person on average transmitted about two and a half. Whereas if you look at other stuff uh, like the influenza or the MERS and even Ebola, it's a lot lower, um, uh, even though Ebola is more deadly. But on the other end are the measles and smallpox and some of these we have managed to uh, manage using vaccines or even completely uh, contain them in a, in a, in a big way. Um, so SARS is new, uh, SARS-CoV-2. It's, it's new in a sense, uh, it's, it's not completely new, but yet new because the, the genome of this virus is uh, a little different compared to uh, the original COVID-2. What this is, is an evolutionary tree of the virus by uh, looking at the genome sequence. Um, There's a uh, paper published in Lancet on January 29th, and we'll come back to that in a second. And what you begin to see is the new COVID is in this branch. But if you start comparing the sequence of uh, the COVID-1, uh, the first virus versus the one current one, um, actually, they're not that close. It's only about 70, 78% or 76% identical, but it's more related to almost to 90, 98% uh, to a bat virus, uh, a specific bat virus. But when this paper was published, we didn't even know how this virus got into the uh, human body uh, through what uh, type of interaction. Um, but we didn't know there are other COVIDs that use uh, one of the uh, receptors, uh, proteases on cell surface, uh, the AS2 uh, in the case of COVID-1 and the COVID, uh, the MERS uh, that came from camels uh, used another receptor called DPP4 or CD26. Uh, so this was blank. This was uh, 26th of uh, Jan uh, 29th of January. In fact, I was in India uh, right around that time when I had just come back uh, and I was reading up about these things. And I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention other than the fact that I knew this, uh, things were happening. Um, and uh, by then, uh, the uh, colleagues in China had already sequenced the genome, made the sequence available, and people knew it coded for uh, about 29 proteins. Um, and we knew from the experience of COVID, the first virus, a lot about a uh, little bit of the biology. By between 29th and uh, February 3rd, uh, already there were papers appearing. There were also concurrent papers, which means people have been working on the virus pretty rapidly as soon as the sequence was available to figure out how does the virus get into the human body? How does it get into the human cell? So the simple answer uh, is uh, it, it, uh, the virus carries a, a surface protein called S protein. It's called the spike protein. It interacts with a human receptor called ACE2. It's an angiotensin con converting enzyme. And this interaction is the key first step for the virus to get into the cell. Um, so uh, this data was big coming out. And, uh, uh, very quickly between uh, January and mid-March, uh, mid uh, there were labs across the world uh, that uh, sequenced, uh, uh, that uh, got X-ray crystal structures. I'm talking about how rampant the science is moving uh, compared to when I told you the discovery of uh, penicillin, uh, the uh, vaccines, the DNA structure. Uh, now we're leapfrogging uh, enormously uh, in, in a very big fashion. And it's happening across the globe and international communities sharing and interacting and, and providing information to see what we can do, how science can defeat this virus or at least contain it. And, uh, and this is all major papers. There are, there are many that have come in terms of structure after this. And so uh, uh, this uh, is, is a structural view uh, uh, on the left. Um, this nicely uh, um, uh, created uh, um, cartoon of the virus. Uh, what you begin to see is this uh, the spike, the little uh, red stuff that's sticking on the surface. Uh, that's the one that uh, interacts with this receptor that I told you, the angiotensin converting enzyme. It actually sits on the cell surface and it's expressed all over the body in many places, but more highly in our uh, nasal passage. And now there is data, even the virus can infect your gut. Uh, and this enzyme is involved in actually managing uh, blood pressure. It's part of a renin angiotensin system. It uh, converts angiotensin peptide of a certain kind to another one that actually does vasodilation. So this has been intensely studied for the last uh, you know, 20 years or 25 years, but yet the virus basically cleverly co-ops this receptor and does things. So the data coming out as, as I was looking at this area, this is not something I work on generally, but it's an opportunistic thing. And you just ask a question, how can I contribute in the midst of this? And the only weapon I have in my arsenal is the science. And so we decided, um, a group of us said, hey, what can we do? We reviewed all the papers and then we started 
saying, hey, uh, you know, there are people who are asymptomatic. There are 80% of the people seem to only have mild symptoms, thankfully. person get hospitalized. About 1% to 5% develop uh, severe symptoms. Shekhar, and, we just lost your screen. Can you check? Uh, sorry. Okay. Are you guys able to see it now again? Yeah? Yeah. Sorry. You're, you're yeah. fine. You guys see this uh, slide? Yes. No? Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, there is a big difference in uh, the response to the virus. And uh, about 1% to 5%, unfortunately, depending on uh, the situation, uh, develop severe symptoms and die. There some even develop kidney failure. It's not just lung. Um, and there are, seems to be some population differences too, but I don't know how true this is. Uh, uh, partly when China had data and Italy had data, it was completely... Men seem to be more susceptible than women, and of course, uh, rightfully, uh, you know, uh, the, the articles uh, attributed to men not washing their hands as often as women. Uh, and this gene is actually an X chromosome, X linked, uh, and, and men have only one copy, women have two, although only one is expressed. Age seems to be clearly a factor, because young people, thankfully, are not affected. And there are other comorbidity factors, and we're all learning a lot about these things. Um, so we simply started with the following hypothesis, which is uh, the virus, the cell, the re receptor, and uh, the interaction between the S protein and this tuning fork like S2, a productive interaction and a permissible replicative environment produces enough virus. But there are people in nature, might uh, uh, many of them might have a receptor that looks like this, and some might have a receptor that is even a better fit, and so they probably, the interaction is enhanced and, and they're going to infect uh, the cells a lot better. Those people carrying these natural variants are probably going to be more susceptible. People that uh, have another form of maybe receptive variation that doesn't allow this interaction to happen very well are going to be less susceptible or even going to be resistant. A simple hypothesis is a cartoon I literally sketched out on a piece of paper and then I called my colleagues in India and I said, uh, um, you know, uh, look, this is an important and a very low-hanging, easy thing where we can make a contribution. And uh, why don't we look at this variation? They said, yes, yes, we'll come back. Uh, meanwhile, other papers came out uh, that basically showed uh, COVID, the new virus. Uh, this is a sensogram of interaction. All, all the take-home messages, the virus, the new virus interacts a lot more. It, it binds to the receptor a lot more tightly compared to the, uh, the uh, COVID-1. Um, and, and, and so that alone is a, a contributing factor, but there are more contributing factors, but this is one. And uh, there are some protease side differences we won't get into it in the processing, but the point is COVID-2 binds to the human receptor a lot more tightly than the COVID-2003 virus. And so that alone makes it, uh, you, you know, hang and, and get into the cell a lot more easily. So if there are alterations in the receptor, uh, that will alter your susceptibility. It'll be an important factor to understand. And, and so that's where we started. This is data from over 300,000 people. Again, this is the spirit of collaboration. This data comes from, uh, uh, you know, UK Biobank, the Nomad, uh, the Genome Asia database, uh, which there are many uh, people uh, that have contributed the samples to this and their polymorphisms are in. Uh, and um, uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, Partha from uh, NIM, NIBMG and the colleagues at Med Genome in Bangalore, um, my colleague Ravi there, qu quickly pulled all of this data. So this data from 300,000 people, uh, and, and uh, we very quickly were able to figure out, there's a pie chart, but on the right is shown the variants that are relevant because from the structural information, we know which residues interact with each other and form these bonds. And uh, so that's marked here. We'll skip this and I'll tell you the context of this in a second. Um, next slide. So when we got this, uh, we very quickly uh, use structural information already available. Uh, both my colleagues uh, in uh, California and there are colleagues in Canada, they quickly took the variants and mapped it on to the ACE2 structure. On the right, what you see, this big blob surface representation is the ACE2 human receptor. And these little black lines are the regions where the virus protein, S protein, interacts. And that footprint basically also leaves certain interactions um, that you can then place the residues where you find alterations in human population and say, well, if I change this residue to one of the other 19 amino acids, what will happen? 
Not only is this the footprint of COVID-2, there is some overlap uh, in this footprint with COVID-1, uh, which is slightly uh, broader. And there is also another virus called NL63. It's also a COVID, but a different type of COVID and that also shares this receptor. So at least three times in human history, uh, there are three coronaviruses that I made sure actually uh, are using ACE2 as its receptor. And this is not going to be the last time. Hopefully, it'll be another 100 years, uh, but maybe not. Uh, and uh, the virus and the receptor co-evolves. And so we can uh, look at these uh, variants uh, that's shown again here in the linear diagram. This is the extracellular domain in yellow here. And these are three, four patches that actually make that interaction. So very quickly using this information, uh, and there's also some other piece of data published by um, another colleague from University of Chicago that's in the bioarchive. And by the way, our paper is in bioarchive. It's not peer reviewed yet. So take it with a pinch of salt, but at the same time, we wanted to make it available to everybody as quickly as possible. And uh, uh, very quickly, we, uh, my colleague uh, Natalia and uh, Divan and um, uh, Fred uh, came back and, and said, hey, we are seeing at least two di distinct pockets. One where residual alterations might increase the risk, meaning increase the affinity of the viral protein, the S protein shown in gray. And there are variants that are going to decrease that interaction. It's a very simple concept uh, and, and very translatable. And so uh, we uh, uh, looked at this data. They looked at the hydrogen bonding, the van der Waals forces, the hydrophobic interactions. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and this does not uh, need a lot of money. It only needs some time investment. And PyMol is in the public domain. The structures are in the public domain. And in fact, we started all of this work sometime probably uh, 10th of March or 12th of March by uh, April 3rd, we actually had a paper and, and we put it in the archive. And that was only possible because of close uh, collaboration with a lot of people. And in terms of what we spent, uh, just our time, other than that, we didn't spend any money. But luckily, then we were able to convince other folks to kind of join us and help uh, with the science. And I'm just showing you a, a small uh, laboratory validation that's still ongoing. Hopefully, we'll get it done in the next uh, couple of weeks and the paper out for review. And what you're seeing is the COVID uh, protein uh, ACE2 interaction measured using an ELISA. And, and uh, there are these variants I showed in the previous slide. And some, uh, the, the, the lower the curve here, it means that it doesn't interact very well. But we see a trend between COVID-1 and COVID-2. But COVID-2 is already interacting much more strongly even with variants that uh, are predicted to confer resistance uh, in the context of COVID-1. But COVID-2 seems to enhance, uh, it, 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 it still interacts better than COVID-1, but some of these mutants provide some level of uh, um, a relief or, or a decrease in the affinity. And uh, in the right here, COVID-1, people know uh, the transmission was through uh, civet. And so uh, um, we looked at the civet uh, S protein. Uh, this is clearly not the intermediary host. There are other theories and ideas. I won't get into it. And uh, there is a glycan in, in here, uh, it, it, uh, you know, in the receptor at uh, position uh, 90, asparagine 90, uh, from the crystal structure. Um, this is uh, discussed as an immune privilege site because uh, there is a, a glycosylation motif. And this is, again, showing the S protein and the interaction between the is too. There's an older paper, but very well uh, written. And there's a glycan that uh, basically changes the interaction and might actually provide immunity. And there is a natural variant at that particular position, though very rare. Uh, there is a threonine at position 92 that will knock off the glycan at position 90 because this motif is required for glycosylation and uh, end glycosylation. And we looked at over 900 different uh, animals, uh, including humans. And we can actually figure out which ones, not only this motif uh, in this interaction region uh, uh, underlined here, and we can build logo diagrams and uh, start asking which animals are going to be susceptible to COVID, which can be a reservoir. And it's pretty clear our cousins, chimps, macaques, bad news, they're going to be infected. They might be reservoirs. They're probably going to transmit. We already know people have shown that uh, uh, macaque and uh, rhesus monkeys, uh, the other models uh, are being developed for this. And uh, um, uh, of course, you can go down and ask cats, uh, other things, um, you know, what um, happens. So uh, I think that uh, basically is the story around uh, this uh, interaction. And we are still evolving this, but uh, we have put out this data. So national 
uh, entities that uh, you know sample patients, treat patients, and collect genetic material, DNA, uh, RNA, and you can more elaborately study with this as one factor. Uh, and I'm going to just quickly end with a couple of uh, um, uh, slides here. I am sorry, something happened here. Okay. So uh, what I want to say is, how do we get through this pandemic? And that's that's the point of all of this work, right? And uh, of course, social distancing is only practical up to a certain point. Uh, we can't live in caves forever. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you, you know, there are some intermediary solutions. One uh, is going to be antigen testing, meaning testing for the virus uh, using some simple tests. There is a race to develop a test uh, that you can test people around. And I can get myself tested every day when I go into work. Physicians can test tested. Students can test, get tested. And the reason is very simple. Asymptomatic people are the ones transmitting uh, and, uh, in a big way. And so if I know I am infectious, I can stay home and, and try to prevent infecting other people. And how do you do that? You got to test for viruses as rapidly as possible. The RNA tests take a long time. Okay. So then the antibody testing is uh, uh, the next thing to figure out herd immunity. And you need high quality tests. There is some confusion. It's definitely going to be important. And that's how you figure out, well, uh, you know, in um, the MGR University, anybody there has tested and there's a large cohort of people that are resistant, which means they cannot transmit. And one of the things, if you look at the uh, influence of pandemic, it took about a third of the world to be uh, infected before immunity became the norm. So if you look at uh, 7.8 billion people, the estimate is between 30 or 40 percent of people have to be either infected or hopefully vaccines arrive or maybe small molecule pills that we can take and manage. There are pills against influenza. I'm sure people will do it. There are a lot of people racing to do it. And there's anti antibodies uh, and other ACE fusions. So that's, that's how we're going to get through this. I'm going to stop here. But I just want to say again, my theme here is uh, uh, this uh, is only possible because we could work seamlessly across the world. And particularly, I'm grateful to all my colleagues in Bolt here in India, without whom uh, we could have not done this. Uh, and I'm going to stop there. Uh, and uh, Rama, if there's anything else that I can uh, add to, please let me know. And I'm going to stop. And thank you again for the opportunity to share our work. So, uh, and you can, uh, since we are short on time, you can sure, take sure. a pick. Yeah. One of them want to know when can the, uh, we, you know, would we be able to uh, predict whether somebody is a carrier or uh, yeah. or going to be susceptible? How soon would that be yeah. with the H2? Yeah, SM? so I think, uh, yeah. So uh, let me again share this uh, last slide uh, 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 very quickly to. But, uh, uh, very simple, right? If you go back up and uh, if you look here, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, the only option right now is staying home, right? But uh, many people are asymptomatic. So you need a viral antigen test that can be done non-invasively in 15 minutes time and should cost maybe no more than 20 rupees or 100 rupees, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and India can innovate. A lot of the people out in the world are innovating and uh, Dr. Tyagarajan uh, spoke before about innovation. And uh, uh, the government of India and the Department of Biotechnology, Biorec, they put out a lot of money. And mm -hmm. uh, they are trying to motivate people to do it. And Rabbi, you and I exchanged some emails about biosensors. Yes. And I think people should, uh, you know, take this very seriously and, and uh, you know, work 18 hour days to kind of make things happen. It's possible. And, and so I think uh, in, in less than probably, I predict, six months, we're going to have antigen tests that people can uh, use uh, mm -hmm. in a very rapid fashion. And that's one development that's going to happen. 
Yeah. We have the tools and, and, and people are working feverishly across the world, not just uh, here in the US, but uh, in every part of the world. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Shekhar. So, okay. Thanks. Uh, a couple of other questions, maybe we can uh, take it. Yeah. So, there is one question about, of course, the BCG vaccine. Do you think it really helps? Then yeah. somebody wanted to know more about the NL63 virus. Yeah. Uh, you, you can, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, uh, NL63 is a very mild virus. Uh, it's uh, the alpha coronavirus. It, uh, it, it uses the same um, receptor, but it, uh, its uh, spike protein behaves a little different.